cases in the Arabic language. Where do we use them? How do we use them? And indeed, why do they even exist at all? In this episode of the Arabic in 60 Steps podcast, I want to give you guys a really detailed and comprehensive explanation as to what case even is as concept. As many of us in the English language, we really aren't familiar with the idea of case itself, and it causes a lot of anxiety to our Arabic language students. So we're going to have a really kind of comprehensive walkthrough of the use of cases in the Arabic language and specifically pertaining to the Arabic in 60 Steps program. So there may be more comprehensive materials out there in the whole world, but um, this is everything students will need for the Arabic in 60 Steps program. And anything beyond this would be very easily added on. You know, So even if your objective is the Arabic in 60 Steps program or not, I think this will be a really useful and comprehensive resource for you. So there are really seven parts to this episode. What I want to do in the beginning is I want to give you guys an introduction just to the idea of what case even is. Like what even is case in the first place? And talk about what it's what they're called in the Arabic language and then other terms as well. Because when you're learning Arabic from the internet, you often kind of absorb a whole hodgepodge of different influences. You'll consume some resources that are written from like a very kind of classical Islamic studies perspective, some resources written by someone like myself who has a bit of an academic background, but still a Muslim. And then some people who come from a very kind of like Western university orientalist perspective who only use like Western grammatical terms. So we're going to talk through what all those terms are and things like that too in this first part of the episode. And then we'll go on to kind of do a breakdown of all the different cases, where they appear and what they look like with lots of examples as well. So let's begin. Let's go into the actual idea of case. What even is case? So actually, it's really good news. I've got good news for you that in the English language, we actually do use case, um, but it's only really reserved for a few words in particular. So let's look at the words I, me and my. These three words in the English language essentially mean the same thing. If you're pointing at yourself, uh, this is kind of represented as I, me and my, right? But we use me, I or my depending on where the word comes in a sentence. So for example, if the, the you person, right, is the one doing the verb in a sentence, we call this the subject in language. If you're the one eating or you're the one seeing. So for example, if we say I saw you, I can't say me saw you. I can't say my saw you because I'm the one doing the verb. So I have to say I saw you. Okay, but if it was you that saw me, I can't say you saw I, right? So if I'm what we call the object of the verb or what the seeing is being done to, then then it would be me, right? So for example, you saw me, you helped me, uh, somebody, somebody gave it to me, for example. And then lastly, the word my. My is what we use for possessives, really. So for example, if we were to say, I saw myself, or I saw my house, or I saw my son, or I saw my daughter. And the good news is that these three words correspond actually quite nicely to three of Arabic's cases for nouns. Not, not entirely, it's not like a 100% overlap, but the notion of having a case for the subject of the sentence, the notion of having a case for the object of a sentence, and the notion of having a case for possession does align a little bit with the morfor case in Arabic, the monsub case, and the majrur case as well. It overlaps somewhat, right? So that's actually the idea of case in and of itself. So what are the cases in Arabic? The cases in Arabic are four. There are four cases, and we'll go through the, the, the names of each of them in Arabic, and then I'll just make you aware of... Um, of the kind of orientalist terms for them. So, so firstly, we have the mod four. The mod four exists for nouns and for verbs. The mod four exists for nouns and verbs. Next, we have the monsoub. The monsoub exists also for nouns and for verbs. It exists for both of them. Then we have what we call the majrur, which only exists for nouns. And then we have the majzum, which only is, exists for verbs. I've actually written um, a short document. Um, it's, it's a bit too short to consider an ebook. I've, I've written a short PDF, which is about six pages, which is a summary of all of my notes for this episode of the podcast. It will be available for students who are students on the Arabic in 60 Steps program. We'll put it in your resources. And then also for members of the YouTube channel as well, um, who support the YouTube channel with just £1.99 a month, I'll make it available for you guys as well. So in there, what you'll see in those resources is a table with two columns. Okay, only two columns, and you'll have like in the right hand column verbs, and in the left hand column is for nouns, right? So you go down the mod four, tick for both of them. The, the monsub, tick for both of them. The majrur, tick for only nouns. 
and majzum tick for only verbs. And there's really good reason for that, which we'll go into. So when we have these four cases, okay, morfor, monsub, majrur, and majzum. Before we move on, I'll tell you what those words even are. Like, what do they even mean? Like, well, well, why do we kind of use those words for them? Good. So what do they mean? So the word um, morfor, the verb rafa'a in Arabic, it means to raise. Right? So the morfor, and the, probably the most common reflection of, the, of, of a word being morfor, is with the dhamma above the word. So perhaps the dhamma has been raised, right? It's, it's morfor, okay? There's a dhamma above the word. As for the monsub, the, the monsub, it means that it's been hoisted, or, or like erected, or planted, right? There's a word nusba, actually, which means like a stake that you put in the ground. And the, the monsub is usually reflected, most commonly, with a fatha, right? And perhaps because a fatha is straight, uh, it's not got a loop like a dhamma. Perhaps it kind of resembles a stake uh, because it's straight, perhaps. Or maybe because it's the shortened version of an elef, right? And an elef really does look like a stake, right? It is something planted and, and, and erect up like that, like a, um, like a tent or something. Very nice, okay. So what about the majrur? The majrur, the verb jarra, majrur, it means to be dragged. And this is usually reflected with a kasra, because a kasra is underneath. It's low, as if it's been dragged underneath the word. Okay, majrur. I'm, I'm not saying this is why the grammarians gave them these words. This is me understanding where these words come from and then making a, making a connection for you. And then lastly, we have the majzum. The majzum, which is only, a, only for verbs. There are no nouns that can be majzum. The majzum is reflected usually with a sukun. And the, verb, and the word majzum really means to be squeezed or like cut short. Right, as if something's mejzum. So, and, and that's what happens with the verbs that are mejzum. So, for example, we usually end up shortening and cutting the vowels in them. So, for example, a verb like yakulu, he says, would become yakul. We, we shorten that u in the middle, and we turn that u on the end into a sukun. So, yakulu would become yakul. Or a verb like yaktubu would become yaktub. Okay, so this is what we do when something is mejzum. Okay, so lastly, for this kind of very beginning part of the podcast, I, I want to just run over some of the other terms for them. So the, the, the morfor, okay, let's go back to the first case that we mentioned. So the morfor, this is referred to in a few different ways, and we'll, we'll go through them so you're aware of them. When I was at university, professors always called this the U case. They put a big capital U, and then we called it the U case. Why? I think because it's usually re- expressed with an oo sound, okay, usually with a dhamma or a wow, like it's most common um, kind of common symbols of, of something being mod for, something being mod for. And that's kind of why, but it's also from a Latin tradition called the nominative. Um, people who are familiar with Latin and other ancient languages, perhaps Greek as well, I'm not sure, um, will maybe be familiar with what the nominative is. And the mod for, in the, in the kind of the next section of this podcast, we'll talk about what the mod for is really used for, but um, the kind of most simple explanation of it is kind of the default case. If you have no other reason to give a word anything else, it will be mod for, okay? Which is why if you go through the vocab list in the Arabic in 60 Steps program, we're always quoting our vocab as ma'un, narun, tinun, right? They've always got oos and uns on the end because it's the default case. If a word appears on its own, there's absolutely no reason for us to change it. It's, it's in its default form. It's not even in a sentence, right? Okay, so that is what we call nominative or u case. To move on to the monsorb. The monsorb, similar to the U case, because it's usually expressed with an U sound, the monsorb is usually called A case, okay, in the Western tradition, A case. And this also aligns in the like classical languages tradition as um, accusative as well. It's called the accusative um, regarding nouns, but the subjunctive regarding verbs. Those of you who have learned Italian, French or Spanish before are probably familiar with the idea of a subjunctive. And I think it's kind of erroneous in some ways to call the monsoon the subjunctive because let languages even vary in like where they use a subjunctive. You know, there's there's things in, in Spanish that you would you that you you would need a subjunctive for that you don't necessarily in French and and vice versa. But um lots of the books, but particularly the one I remember is um the is it five hundred and one Arabic verbs, that that kind of chunky yellow and blue book. Um, that has a column called the subjunctive, but they mean they mean the monsoub, right? But they've used the subjunctive because they're kind of appealing to English-speaking um, languages people. Very nice. Okay, so we've got, yeah, monsoub, which is the Arabic term, a case, which is kind of an Orientalist term, accusative and subjunctive, which are terms for, for uh, nouns and verbs, respectively. As for the majrur, the one expressed with the kasra, um, much like we had a U case and an A case, we also have an I case, okay? Like, 
as I say, the, the Orientalist tradition will often refer to this as the I case. Um, and it's also called the genitive. Okay, the, the, the genitive is how it's referred to in, in like a Latin tradition. And then finally, majzum is referred to as the zero case. But you, you usually see it written with like a um, with like a diagonal line through the O. I think, I don't, I don't know why that is. Like, uh, I think that's to kind of make people aware that it's not actually an O sound. I don't know, it reminds me of like the Scandinavian languages that use that in their languages. Like it will be written with, a, with like an O. And we always refer to it as zero case. Um, but it is also called the jussive. Um, the jussive, and I've also seen recently in a dictionary it be referred to as the apocopate. The apocopate isn't a word that I had come across until quite recently, okay? But apparently the jussive is the apocopate, which is the zero case, which is uh, mejizum. In terms of the Arabic in 60 Steps program, and for the rest of this podcast, we will use the Arabic terms, okay? We, we, we just like the Arabic terms. We think it's good practice to have students get used to the Arabic terms. So we'll kind of keep it consistent with that. Good. Okay. So if you remember the table that I turned your attention to before, um, for those who are watching on YouTube, I'll put it up on the screen. But for those on the podcast, I'll explain it to you as clear as I can. Imagine a table with two columns and five rows. In one of the columns at the top, it has verbs. In the other column at the top, it has nouns. So if we take the first case at hand, the model four, we can tick that. It, has, it applies to nouns and it applies to verbs. Monsorb, it applies to verbs and nouns and it applies to verbs. The majrur, it applies only to nouns, and the majzum, it applies only to verbs. The next kind of six parts of this podcast are going to go through those different things individually. So we're going to talk about the mod four for the nouns, everything that triggers it, all the ways it can look like with examples. And then next we'll go through mod four of verbs, all the things it can look like, all the triggers with examples. And then the monsorb for nouns, and the monsorb for verbs with all the triggers, what it can look like, and examples. Good, and then the majorur, and then the monsorb. Sorry, sorry, then the majzum, finally. So, without further ado, inshallah, we'll move on. And I'll try to make sure that I put timestamps for each of these in the, uh, in, the, in the description as well. Okay, good. So, this is kind of section two. Now, we're going to talk about mod four, specifically for nouns. Okay, so I mentioned that the first kind of... Um, um, the first um, symbol, right... The symbol of it being mod four, the most common is a dhamma or two dhammas, right? Dhamma or dhammatain. That is the most that is the most common symbol for something being mod four. So what kind of causes a word to be mod four? We mentioned it being the default. Okay, like if you're just giving a word on its own, rajolun, a man, right? Or in the definite, or rajolu. Or if we're just giving the word baytun, a house, or the house al baytu on its own, it's the default case. The next one, which is probably um, the most important in terms of chronologically going through the program, is what we call the mubtadet. If you begin a sentence with a noun. So, for example, if you say, Assalamu alaykum, when you say, peace be upon you, Assalamu, we begin with, Assalamu alaykum. We always put Assalamu at the beginning. If we said, Assalamu alaykum, we'd be making the salam. Um, we'd be making it monsoub by putting a fatah on the end. There's no need, there's no reason to. This is the mubtada. It goes at the beginning of the sentence. And likewise, if we were to say um, al-rajulu latifun, the man is kind, or al-baytu jamilun, but we'll always begin a sentence with the mubtada. A, a noun at the beginning of a sentence is a mubtada, and it will be morfur. The next one is if we turn, I'll turn your attention to step ten. Is the ism of kana. Okay, so when we have a kerna sentence, so you know, for example, I just gave I just gave the example of al baytu jamilun, right? The the house is beautiful, al baytu jamilun. The ism of kerna, al baytu is what would be now. If we're saying the house was beautiful, we'll say kerna al baytu, and then we'll say jamilan. Okay, the jamilan is something which we can put in your pocket for a minute, and we won't need it until we come to the monsoor because it ends in ends. Good. Okay, so the ism of kana is the next one. So we had, by default, words are mod four. And then secondly, the mubtada of a sentence is mod four. And then the ism of kana is mod four. So the word coming directly after kana. Kana rajulu latifan. The man was kind. Kana rajulu tawilan. The, the man was tall. Very nice. Okay, so if the ism of kana is mod four, likewise, the khabar of inna is also mod four. We do this in step 19, I believe, in the program when we do inna and her sisters. So 
so for example, if we keep it with the example of um, a house is beautiful, right? If we're not saying the house was beautiful, like with Kana, we're saying indeed the house is beautiful. We'd say in al bayta. Again, put al bayta in your pocket because we won't need it until not for, until we do the the, the mansub. But the what we call the khabar of inna will be marfu'. Okay, so we'd say in al bayta jamilun. And actually, there's many times in the Quran when you see this when Allah might end an ayah or many times actually end a surah saying in Allah sami'un basir, for example, or in in Allah ghafoon rahim, for example. So the ghafoon, ghafoon, or ghafoon, or rahimun, right? Those are marfu'a because they are the khabar of inna. So by default, they are marfu'a. Also the mubtada of a sentence. Also the ism of kana, and also the khabar of kana. If we move on, okay, to other, other triggers of something being, um, of, so not really triggers actually, we're actually moving on to um, another symbol, okay? I'm using the term symbol because when you do what we call i'rab in the Arabic language, like often um, books um, for teaching um, Islamic, any kind of Islamic science actually, um, quite often there'll be like i'rab in the footnotes and stuff, certainly certainly in the like Islamic education um, tradition here in Somalia anyway. They'll, be, they'll often be like, you know, they'll kind of highlight a word in a passage and say that this is um, this is mubtada marfu'a. This is a mubtada of the sentence, which is marfu'a. And then they say, wa'ilama tu raf'ihi. And the wa'ilama, the alama, the, the symbol of its raf'a, the symbol of it being marfu'a, is ad-dhamma ala akhirihi, for example, the, the dhamma on the end. That's, so the, I'm, I'm taking that from the Arabic language tradition of explaining why things are certain cases and, and how they reflect them using the symbol, using the term alama. There will be times when something which is marfu'a is in fact not expressed with a dhamma, okay? And not expressed with the dhamma or dhammatayn. With the sound plural, we use una on the end. And in this case, we wouldn't say wa'alamatu rafi'ihi. We wouldn't say and the symbol of its rafa' is a dhamma. We'd say wa'alamatu rafi'ihi al-waw is what we'd say in this case with the una ending, okay? Or on the second column down, and if those of you who are looking at the book later. Una. So for example, if we have the word muslimun, the plural is muslimuna. Or if we have the word mu'min, meaning a believer, the plural is mu'minuna. So it's important to make this distinction because here we have a situation where we have una ending in a na. So that fatah on the end, lots of students might look at that and might think, well, it must be monsub then. It must be a case, right? But it's not. The wow is the symbol of it being marfu'a. Okay, we'll carry on. Likewise, um, there are some cases where we actually cut off this noon. There's some rules in the Arabic language, some triggers for us doing some, what we call hadhaf um, noon, re- removing the noon. Okay? And one time when we do this with the una ending, so for example with muslimuna, we may cut that off when muslimun is a mudaf. So for example, if we're saying the Muslims of a certain place, or the Muslims um, yeah, of a certain place, I think is a good example of it. For example, in the Rihla of Ibn Jubayr, um, Ibn Jubayr's travel writings, he has a chapter in there called Muslimu Akka. Not Muslimun Akka, it is Muslimu with no noon on the end, because it's a mudaf. It's the Muslims of Akka. Muslimu Akka. So the wow as well can be a symbol of being Rafa with no noon on the end. Muslimu Akka. And this same thing, you can kind of, it's the same symbol, but I'm going to give you another reason for it to be that symbol. It could also be that symbol if the word is one of the five nouns. The five nouns in Arabic are abu, ahu, famu, hamu, and dhu. There's five of them in Arabic that express their case with a long vowel. So for example, if we're going to say her father, it would be abu ha, her father, or her brother, ahu ha, for example, or her mouth, fu ha. Okay, so 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 a, a indicator of something being uh, mod four can just be a well. Okay, we'll move on. Another another symbol for something being mod four is in the dual, where you actually have an elif and a noon. You have an any ending. So this one is is another one which kind of could catch students off guard actually, because there's no indication to a u case. There's no oo sound in there at all with the ani ending. So, for example, if we take the word for two Muslims, muslimani, okay, or two girls, bintani, or two uh, boys, waladani, okay? So this dual ending, it is morfor, but there's no dhamma or any oo sound in sight, which is, again, why I think it's kind of erroneous to, to call it the U case, because 
no one can tell you that waladani isn't marfu'ah, right? And, and likewise, if you're doing i'rab of this, if you're saying waladani, uh, whatever it comes in the sentence, if it's the, um, let's say, the ism of kana, uh, ismu kana marfu'ah, wa alamatu rafi'ihi, and the symbol of its rafi'ah, um, al-alif, like the, the symbol of it being marfu'ah is an alif. Right? Good, but that is the only reason for that. It's only if it's dual in the marfu'ah will I have ani. There aren't other reasons for that. And the same way, you know, how we did a hadith al noon when something was a mudaf, when we had the Muslims of Akka. Akka is a place, by the way. Um, so, Muslimu wa Akka, we did hadith al noon with, with Una, right, with Muslimuna. We can also do this with, for example, Waladani, okay? We can, if it's a mudaf, if Waladani, the two boys, if we might actually have to cut off that noon if it's an yandafa. So, for, for example, I actually have two sons. If I had to say, my two boys, I would say, Waladai. Waladai. Okay, I'd say my two boys. Right, that noon would cut off. We wouldn't say we, we don't say waladani. We say waladaya. We actually cut that off when it's a mudaf. Or if we were to say the two Muslims of Syria, for example, we'd say mus Muslima Surya, Muslima Surya. So we cut off that noon when it's a mudaf. So actually, an alif in this case, on its own, on its own, can be a symbol of rafer. Can be a symbol of a word being. Marfur. Finally, this is the final symbol that we teach in the Arabic in 60 Steps program for a word being marfur. It is two kasaras on the end. It's actually a piece of grammar which is quite technical, okay? So so if you need to pause the video and go and get a cup of tea or whatever, then then don't be shy to do so because some of these things, many of my graduates even, they, they get it right and they're okay in the, they're okay in the, um, uh, in the, in the program and in the exam. But... Um, yeah, but then later they tell me that they've only really understood it a few months later because, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat technical. Okay, so words in Arabic that end in a weak letter. We call these fi'l naqas, these words that are naqas. For example, verbs like nesia, for example, he, he forgot, or the verb like baqiya, he remained. Um, and even and it even applies to nouns, actually, as well. For example, like the word layla or layl in Arabic, meaning the night, the plural is layali. So words that are, are, are weak in their ending, they have a vowel on the end. When they're in the modifora and when they're indefinite, Arabic doesn't really like the sound of having iyun e, e, on the end. Like if there's a shadda, iyun e, is okay, like arabiyun is okay if there's a shadda, right? But, um, but if there's not, Arabic doesn't really like to, for example, have, if somebody is forgetful, right? They are a forgetter, you'd have nasiyun, nasiyun. Arabic doesn't really like this yun on the end. So what it does is we get rid of that ya yeah, and we have nasin, even in the mod four. Okay, or for example, if we were to have, um, um, yeah, someone remaining, okay, you can have baqi, the, the remaining, right? But if this is in the model four and the indefinite, it is just baqin. You remove the e on the end to make it baqin. And likewise, with layali, you can't have layalion, you have layalin. You cut off that yeah on the end and to put two kasadas, layalin. Um, that is from step 17 in the Arabic in 60 Steps program. For those of you who want to kind of brush up on that, step 17, inshallah. Very nice, okay. So let's continue with section three in the podcast, where we'll be talking about mod four. We're still with mod four, but now we're talking about the mod four of verbs rather than the mod four of nouns. So once again, kind of the most common indicator of something being mod four is the dhamma. So when we take verbs in the present tense and we have yaktubu, We'll have a dhamma on the end. Or when we have yajlisu, he sits, we'll have a dhamma on the end. Or yaqara'u, we'll have a dhamma on the end. And then that's even applied to many of the persons as well, but particularly in the singular. So, for example, he reads yaqara'u. Um, she reads taqara'u. You read taqara'u, and then you in the feminine, let's do that after. And then I, aqara'u, and even we, nahnu, naqara'u, we, we read. Um, so that brings us on to the feminine, actually, which is why I went over it. So when we have enti, you in the feminine read. We don't have taqara'u again, we have taqara'ina. So the second kind of um, symbol of something being mod for is the ina on the end. This word, even though it ends in a fatha, even though it has no u in sight, it is still mod for, okay? There's no reason for it to be anything otherwise. You can just say taqara'ina, you, you read. Taktubina, you write. Tajlisina, you sit. Okay, and then that is still mod four. So the ina can actually be an indicator of something being mod four. Very nice. However, 
Um, if we move into the plurals and the duals, we'll find some more endings. So the plural, um, just like we saw with muslimuna, actually, in the in verbs, we can have this una on the ending as well, and it still be mod four. But once again, its its indicator of being mod four is the well. So for example, in the plural, we have yaktubuna, they write, yaktubuna. Or in the dual, we'd have yaktubani. So this ani, they write in the dual, as in two of them, right? Um, this ani can actually be a symbol of something being mod four. And then lastly, a na, just with a noon, with one fatah on the end, that can also be a symbol of, of a verb being mod four in the feminine plural. So for example, yaktubna, yaktubna. We're saying they write, but in the feminine, if all of them are women. Or tektubna, you write, if all of you are women, okay? So the symbols of some of a verb being mod four can be a dhamma on the end. It can be ina in the case of enti. It can be una in the case of um, masculine plurals. It can be any in the case of the dual. And it can also be na in the case of the plural feminine of those verbs. Okay, that's pretty brief, actually. Like that. There's not really much nuance to that at all. So we'll move swiftly on to the monsub of nouns. This might be the largest category. Now, the monsub of nouns, because there are lots of reasons for something to be monsub. There's lots of reasons for nouns to be monsub. However, like my Arabic teachers have often told me that if you're ever in an exam and you need to put the case endings on everything, um, they've often told me that the, their best advice is to put a kasra if you don't know. Okay, I'm not sure if I agree with that. Like now, now I've I've recently marked um, students of the Arabic in 60 Steps program. I've recently marked their exams, and looking at it, I think a lot of them might have been served better if they put ele put fetas on the end, because um, there's, there's lots of reasons for something being monsoub. Okay, so of course the first um, symbol of something being monsoub, you could guess, is a fetha or two fetas, right? A or N on the end, which obviously, you know, you would expect with it also being referred to as the A case sometimes. As we mentioned, actually, the beginning of the lesson when I gave you the example in English, how I kind of corresponds with the mod four for nouns, right? The, the, the subject of sentences um, as a default and things like that kind of corresponds with I. Likewise, the, mod, the monsoub kind of corresponds to the word me in English because we use it as the object of sentences. So, for example, you saw me, you helped me. Likewise, in Arabic, if I was to say you saw me, I would have to use I'd have to use the monsoub for this. I'd have to say ni, you saw me. Ni. So let's talk about it. Um, besides the pronouns, actually, let, let, let's let's stick to uh, as we've mentioned this first fathas and two fathas. So firstly, the object of the sentence, right? If we were to say you saw a man, ra'ayta rajolan, you saw a man, or I saw uh, the lion, or I ate al asad, or I ate um, uh, uh, dates. Okay, akaltu timran. I ate dates. Very nice. Okay, so that is if it's the object of the sentence. The next two examples will kind of mirror things that we saw in um, the mod four of nouns as well. So you know how we learnt how the ism of kana is mod four. The khabar of kana is monsoub. So if you if you remember, I asked you to put um, jamilan in your pocket when we talked about kana al-baytu jamilan, the house was beautiful. Bring that out of your pocket now, because that is what we call the khabar of kana. Kana al-baytu jamilan. And then likewise with inna, the sisters of inna, we swap those two around. So with kana, the ism was mod four. But with inna, the khabar is mod four, which means that the ism is actually what is monsoop in this case. So if we have, if I, if I bring you back to inna allaha ghafoorun rahim, for example, then the allaha takes a fatha. So triggers that we've covered so far for things being monsoop. Number one, the object of a sentence. In Arabic, we call this the maf'oolun bihi. Next, the, um, uh, the khabar of kana and the ism of inna. Okay, the khabar of kana is monsoob and the ism of inna is also monsoob. Next up, I done something which we do a bit later in the program, step 46, something like that. It's called the mafrul mutlaq. The mafrul mutlaq. This corresponds to an expression which we wouldn't use in English because people might think you're mad. But it really translates like this. I read it an enthusiastic reading or I saw him an intense seeing or I hit him a hard hitting. Okay, this is what we call the mafrul mutlaq. In Arabic, and it's when we're using, we're using the mustard of a of a verb, 
Okay, we're using the noun of a verb. In, in the case that I just mentioned, hitting would be the noun from the verb hit. Okay, so I hit him, a hard hitting. And we're describing the noun, hard hitting. We're using an adjective to describe the noun rather than to describe the verb. Okay, so, you know, um, I, you know, ضربته ضربا شديدا would be the, the translation of that. I hit him a severe hitting. Okay, so we say ضربته, I hit him, ضربا, so the, the actual mustard, the, the noun, ضربا شديدا, I hit him, a hard hitting. Good, that is the mafrul mudlaq. And we use, um, yeah, we use fataz on the end of that. Next up, a next kind of trigger or a cause for this symbol is for the adverbs of time. So for example, غدن, tomorrow. Raden. We, we always have fathas on the end of Raden, okay? You know, sofa, azur, or sadiqi, I'll visit my friend Raden, okay? Or we also use it for time as well. For example, um, أنا استيقظ, I wake up, أنا استيقظ الساعة السابعة. We'll always say الساعة السابعة. We use fathas on it when we're talking about the time. Or even when we say today, okay? أنا أدرس العربية اليوم. I'm, I'm, I teach Arabic today, or I'm teaching Arabic today. With al meaning today, or lend in a fatha. So these, these adverbs of time, these doing something today, tomorrow, at a certain o'clock, or whatever, we use fathas on the end of those. The next one, this is a little rule which we call at-tamiz. at it means distinction. And it's like saying that something is more than something in a particular way. So for example, you know, like the, the, where this actually comes from, I'll, I'll take a really useful tangent here, actually. So a way that you usually say something is bigger or something is better, we, we use comparatives and superlatives. We usually use the pattern in Arabic, أفعلو. So for example, we take a word like kabir, big, akbar, it means bigger. So for example, but it's very easy to do that with a word like kabir, because we have three very clear root letters, ka, ba, and ra, kabir, right? So it's very easy to put that into akbar. Or it's very easy to do it with the word صغير, أصغر. Okay, so you could say هو أكبر um, مني or هو أصغر مني. He's smaller than me or he's bigger than me. But it gets a bit difficult to do that with nouns, for example, like um, like uh, to be sincere, for example, right? To be مخلص, right? Like مخلص doesn't have like a... You kind of need all of the letters to, to make it مخلص. Or like, you know... Um, uh, for example, the word mujtahid being hard working, for example. Like, there's sort of too many letters. You have like the mu and the ta at the beginning. Like, it, it doesn't really fit into afalu. There's just too many letters for it. So, what do we do instead? Okay, to do the tamiz, we need to say, for example, if we're to take the word mukhlis and the word mujtahid, to say that someone is more sincere than someone, or someone is more hard working than someone, or maybe someone is more religious than someone, someone is more mutadayin than someone else. What you do in Arabic is you say huwa, if you're referring to a man, huwa akthar minni, he is more than me. And then to do the tamiz, we take the mustar of the word. So for example, with mukhlis, the, the word for sincerity is ikhlas. So we'd say huwa akthar minni ikhlasan. And we need to use the word ikhlasan in the monsub, because this is tamiz. He is more sincere than me. Huwa akthar minni ikhlasan. Or he is more hardworking than me. Huwa, not mujtahid. Huwa akthar minni ijtihadan. Because we need to use the mustar of muj, mujtahid. And then likewise with mutadayin, with religious. He is more in me, he is more than me religion wise. Okay, that's a little bit like what we're saying. Or religiosity wise. Huwa akthar minni tadayyunan. He is more than me. Today yonen with fathas because this is monsoon because that ten years is a trigger of something being monsoon. Very nice. The next kind of trigger. There's still five more <laughs> in these. So as I say, putting fathas on the end of something if you don't know is is kind of a good idea, particularly if it's something that's been written by someone else and you have to put fathas in it. Like usually students until they're at a very advanced level, they don't. Their preference for expressing their ideas isn't by using a tamiz in the mafral mutlaq. People usually avoid them until they're very advanced, right? The next one is using kam. Ma ma'ana kam? Kam yani, kam means how many or how much, okay? And if we're using kam as a question, okay, if I'm asking you how many, something, the word that comes after kam needs to be monsub, okay? So for example, if I'm saying, how many students? In this university, I'll say, كم طالباً في هذه الجامعة? 
كم طالبا it has to be we're asking a question أو كم سورة في القرآن how many surahs are there in the Quran for example okay so that's really important that sometimes you will hear كم and the next word will have كسرس okay for example كم طالب but, but I want you to put that in your pocket for the next section of the podcast. Okay, I want you to put it in your pocket because we'll need it when we do the majrur. We don't need that right now. Okay, the next one is for the counted noun after numbers. So for the numbers 11 until 99, okay, the numbers from 11 till 99, the word that comes after them, the counted words, so if we're saying 26 houses, uh, 15 boats, uh, 22 men, the word men will be singular with fatahs. So for example, if I want to say um, um, uh, 25 okay, 25 girls, or um, what's another example that I put down? Um, yeah, 35 for example, 35 years. Good, the, the word that comes after will have fatahs afterwards. Or, or for example as well, when we, um, when we hear in Surah Yusuf, Ahada Ashara Kaukaban, okay, 11 Kaukaban, 11 um, heavenly bodies, let's say, or 11 planets or stars, however you want to translate it. Ahada Ashara Kaukaban. Very nice, okay, because it's singular and has fatahs on the end. Something will be monsoub and will be expressed with a fatah on the end. In the vocative, if it's a mudaf. So, what is the vocative? Is when we say, yeah. Ya ayyuha, we're calling out Ya Muhammad, Ya whoever, okay? Sometimes the one you're calling out to, okay, will it will be an idafa. Okay, so for example, if we're saying Amir al Mu'minin, the commander of the believers, right? We'd say Ya Amir al Mu'minin. We'll have a fatha after Amira, okay, because that, that's just a rule about the vocative. Ya Amir al Mu'minin. And likewise, if this was one of the five nouns as well. You know, when we talked about the five nouns being Abu, Ahu, Hamu, Famu, and Dhu. Um, likewise, you'll hear people call out, Ya Aba Bakr. Oh, Aba Bakr. But we'll talk about that a little bit more when we come on to the, um, the symbol of, um, of, uh, of Nasab, of Mansur being the Alif. Good, but in this case, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, Ya Malik al. Ya Malik al Ard, O King of the King of the Land, Ya Malik al Ard, Ya Rabb al Bait, O Lord of the House, it would be. Ya Rabb al, or whatever, right? Ya Rabb al Alameen, it would be. Very nice. Okay, or, or if you're talking to somebody whose name was Abdullah, okay? Ya Abdullahi, Ya Abdullahi. Good. Next, next up, we've only got two more, I promise, okay? Next one is when we use La and Nafia lil jins. La, the la of absolute negation. And I'm pretty confident that all of you will have heard an example of la and na fi Do you ever wonder why we don't say la ilahu illallah? Or why don't we say la ilahi illallah? Rather we say la ilaha illallah. This is because when you use la and the word after it takes a fatha, you're saying there is absolutely none of this thing. In this case, we're saying la ilaha bima'ana la ma'buda, with the meaning of there is nothing worthy of worship. La ma'buda. Good, so that is la and nafiya lil jins. So, for example, there's lots of these, like the expression in Arabic la budda, it means you must do something, or la shakka, there is no doubt. Okay, and then the last example is after, um, uh, uh, what is it? After anna. So, yeah, so Anna, um, I think we actually maybe, we maybe talked about this with Anna, because, uh, I mean, like, Anna we can talk about on its own, but Anna is a sister of Inna, so it would apply, the same rules would apply, right? Yeah, the same rules would apply, but, um, but I'll just tell you anyway, okay, so Anna, it means that, okay? We could say Anna Rajula, that the man is a sariq, for example, he's a thief, okay? So Anna A'atakidu, I think, Anna A'atakidu, Anna Rajula, that the man, sariqun, that the man is a thief, for example. So after Anna, but, but it's the exact same rule as what we talked about with Inna uh, earlier. Uh, maybe I could have been a bit clearer and said, when talking about the, um, the, the ism of Inna and the Khabar of Kana, I'm talking about. I'm talking about the khabar of Kana and all of her sisters. Okay, so including verbs like asbaha, mazala, um, amsa, odha, like all of those sisters of Kana, you can Google them. And likewise, when I'm saying inna, 
I'm talking about inna, inna, wa kullu akhawatiha, and all of her sisters. Okay, very nice. Okay, so what is the next kind of um, symbol of something being? What is the next symbol of something being monsorb? The next symbol is ina on the end, much like we talked about the sound plural of um, Muslim being muslimuna. If it's in the monsorb, it will be muslimina. Okay, so muslim, muslimina. So for example, if it's the object of a sentence, I saw the Muslims, ra'aytul muslimina. I saw the Muslims. The next one, if it's in the dual, it will be aini. So I saw the two Muslims, ra'aytul muslimaini. And if you remember how we talked about how una, we can do hadha for noon, when muslimuna is a mudaf. We talked about the Muslims of Akka, for example. Muslimu wa Akka. And we talked about cutting off the noon with muslimani to make it muslima Surya, the two Muslims of Syria, for example. We do this exact same thing um, with uh, ina, as in muslimina, to make it muslimi. And we also do the same thing with muslimaini to make it muslimai. So, um... So we actually hear this in the Quran sometimes with the term um, walidayya, like wa'ala walidayya, and, and upon my two parents, wa'ala walidayya. We're not saying wa'ala walidayni, we say walidayya. And then likewise with, with e, so if you were to say, um, um, I, saw, um, I saw the Muslims of, I saw the Muslims of uh, Cairo. Just for example, right? You would say, "Ra'aytu Muslimi Muslimi Qahira." Al Qahira or Qahira? I think it's Al Qahira actually. Muslimi Al Qahira. It's been a long time since I've visited Al Qahira. It sounds right to say Al Qahira. Naam. Ra'aytu Muslimi Al Qahira. I saw the Muslims of of Al Qahira. Okay, and then I kind of touched on this next thing, but um, um, yeah, if if um, the, with the five nouns, they are mansub their symbol of being monsoor will be an alif. Okay, so for example, ab, abu, will become aba. So for example, if I saw your father, ra'aytu abaka, I saw your father. And then same with the vocative, ya aba bakr, or um, ya akha, someone else, right? I believe actually in the Quran, I believe Saleh is referred to as um, the brother of Thamud. They say, ya akha Thamud, o, o, brother of, o brother of Thamud. Good. Okay. So yeah, and, and to and to go over them again, like ab. So in this case, I'll, I'll go through all of them in the in the monsoor, because that's the chapter that we're on. So um, aba would be father, akha would be brother, fa would be mouth, um, hama would be like in law, and the would be possessor of something. Okay. Very nice. So let's move on to the monsoor for verbs, which is section five in this episode of the podcast. Monsoub for verbs. There are fewer here, actually, but there are a number of triggers to be aware of. So, once again, the most common of the appearances is a fatah on the end, okay? Um, yeah, that, that is the, it is really the case that if you want a quick rule that will serve you a lot of the time, malfura means a damma, monsoub means a fatha, majroor means a kasra, majzum means a sukun. okay? If, if you want a rule that will serve you a, lot, a bunch of the time, then then just roll with that, right? And like in, in step one of the Arabic in 60 steps program, when we kind of give a very, very brief introduction to what case is, we really just teach that monsoop is a fatah and modafor is a dhamma. Because that, that kind of does serve you. For what you need in step one, like our goals in step one are really just to make you aware of the concept of it. Um, but in this podcast, we're spending an hour going into the real details, the nitty gritty of what the causes, the triggers and, and examples are. A verb um, which has a fatah on the end, um, it can have a fatah on the end, when it comes after a few triggers. And I'll go over the main ones that we do in the program. So firstly is after len. Len means won't. It's a way of making a verb future negative. So if we take the verb yektubu, okay, it means he writes. If we want to say he will not write, we say len yektuba. After len, it needs to put a fatah on the end of the verb after it. If it's singular, except with ina, right? Because ina has its own thing going on. Good, as we talked about before. Okay, len... Len ektuba, I will not write. Len asoma, I will not fast. Len usafira, I will not travel. And likewise, after hatta, so len is a trigger of a monsoon verb, as is hatta, as the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a very well-known hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى حتى ماذا حتى يحب أم يحبه يحبه 
Is it not so? Is it not Allah? Is it not Hatta Yuhibba? So the Messenger of Allah is saying, لا يؤمن أحدكم Not one of you will believe. Hatta until Yuhibba, until he loves. لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه لأخي, for his brother, ما يحب لنفسه What he loves for himself. Very nice. So Hatta Yuhibba. Good. Hatta Yuhibba. So hatta is another trigger of a verb being monsub. Next is an. See this. This is the thing that is most commonly um, um, not done correctly in the final exam for the Arabic in 60 Steps program. Using an to mean that. So for example, we do this very regularly in Arabic. We say, uridu an usafira. I want to travel out. Um, أو يجب أن it must be something يجب أن أكتب I must write or um, ينبغي أن I should right or someone should ينبغي أن تزور أمك for example you you should visit your mother right whenever we have a, a verb أن something what comes after أن it needs to be منصوب okay it needs to be منصوب so um, يجب أن أجتهد I need to work hard for example so after أن the word after needs to have a fatah. So we talked about in terms of triggers for making a verb monsub. Len, hatta, en. Next, just like len, we have li en. Li en, it kind of ends up meaning sort of because, or so that, or in order to. It becomes that sort of meaning. So the example I have is, سافرتو li en azura al amira. Okay, سافرتو, I traveled, li en azura, in order to. In order to is a nice translation, actually. But literally translates to, like, to that. I translated to that I visit I visit the emir I visit the commander or the prince right good so li an just like an is a trigger of the verb that comes after it being monsub good next um the word k k it means something very similar to li an actually it's kind of like an in order to it's very causal right so for example if i say jitu k abia i came au abiahu i came to buy it jitu i came K. K can actually be used with li at the beginning, actually. Li K to, in order to. Abi'ahu, in order to buy it. The verb ba'a means to buy, and the hu is referring to an it, right? So K and li K are both triggers also of the verb after them being monsub. Good, and then we also have lam. We have like lam, I believe they call it lam sebabiya, actually, the lam of, 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 of reason. So you can put this before verbs as well, actually. So for example, um, jitu. لأقرأ. I came to read. جئت لأقرأ القرآن, for example. I came to read. We can use a ل much like an actually. For example, like um, yeah, to say you want to do something like um, أريد أن أسافر أو ممكن نقول or, or we can say um, or we could say أريد لأسافر. I want I want for the tra I want for I travel. Right. ل and an are kind of interchangeable a lot of the time actually. Okay. So those are the cases when the appearance of monsoor would be a fatah on the end of the verb. And those are the triggers for them. And it will be like that in the persons that we mentioned as well. Like it will be like that, um, for example, if we said len aktoba, I will not write. I will not write, yeah. Or len taktoba, you will not write or, or she will not write. And then also len aktoba, I will not write. Or len naktoba, we will not write. However, with anti, with you in the feminine, we would usually have an ina on the end, wouldn't we? I don't know if you remember tektubina. An ina was a symbol of something being more for. With e, with ina, we end up doing hadha for noon here. With what we call the five verbs. We talked about the five nouns. Don't get it confused with the five nouns. With the five verbs, okay, what these are are enti, hum, huma, entum, and entoma. Okay, so it's enti, you in the feminine. And then the masculine of... The second person, plural and dual, you and Tom and and Toma, and then in the third person, masculine and dual, so hum and huma. Those are the five nouns, the five verbs rather. And what we do with all of those is we do have the for noon. So with enti, if we, for example we're going to say you will not write, we wouldn't say tektubina, we'd say len tektubi, len tektubi. Very nice, len tektubi. That's the symbol of it being monsub. You know. If we left it as ina, it already has a fatah on it. Like it wouldn't be distinguished in any sense from the model four, right? So it's kind of a way that we distinguish it. Spoiler alert, by the way. It's exactly the same for the Mejizum. You know, spoiler alert. Good. Okay. 
The next one. We also do have the for noon, as I mentioned. Well, if you understand the five verbs as I just mentioned, they will answer the next two things. So, so with hum, um, with hum um, and entum, the plurals in the masculine. So, for example, uh, tektubuna and yektubuna. Okay, you all write and they all write. If we have len before them, for example, and there needs to be mansub, then we just cut off the noon and we replace it with an elif. We Arabic with verbs doesn't like ending words with a wow. Okay, you'll put an el, a silent elif there. So, for example, it will be len yaktubu, they will not write, or len tektubu, you all will not write. So we do have a noon with those. And then likewise with um, with huma and entuma as well, rather than having any on the end, for example, yaktubani, the two of them, right? We just have len yaktuba, the two of them, they will not write. Len yaktuba. Um, and if it was in the second person, if it was you, len tektuba, the two of you uh, will not write. Okay, so we're just doing have a noon. And we cover the concept of words being um, the, the five verbs. We cover that concept in step 11 or 12, I believe. Probably step 11. I think I would have wanted to introduce it to you before, um, before we move on to step 12. Very nice. Okay, so those are the triggers, the causes, and the appearances with examples of monsorb verbs. Let's move on to section six, the penultimate section of this podcast. May Allah give you guys sabr and a strength for, for focusing through all of this. This is such a comprehensive, um, kind of full um, episode of the podcast. And I'll also remind you as well, there is a whole um, document for this that's available for students on the Arabic in 60 Steps programs, um, uh, program singular, there's not multiple programs. Um, and then also for people who support the YouTube channel as well. Cool. Okay, so let's have a look at this. The Majroor for nouns. Why is the Majroor only for nouns? Okay, so far the mod 4 applied to both verbs and, and nouns, and the monsub also applied to verbs and nouns. So why does the Majroor not apply to verbs? Well, probably the most common trigger of the of jar, of something being Majroor, is um, is it coming after a preposition? Fi, in, an, about, ma, with. And you don't put prepositions before verbs. You don't say ma aqra'u. I don't say like with I read or man um, usafir or about I travel, you know, like you, you can't put prepositions before directly before verbs like that. So, um, yeah, so, so it couldn't really be possible for a verb to be majdur, right? It's only nouns that can be majdur. So, um, you know, as you could probably guess, the kasra or kasratain is the most common um, indicator for something being um, for, for something being majroor. So let's have a look at the reasons. I've already mentioned the most common one, prepositions, okay? The word that comes after prepositions, most of the time, well, it will always be majroor, even if it's not expressed with a with a kasra, okay? There are some types of words that would express themselves as being majroor with a fatah. Okay, but we'll talk about that afterwards. But after prepositions, so for example, fil qalb in the heart will have fil qalbi or fil bayti in the house or ma rajuli with the man or bismillahi for example by the name of allah bismillahi uh, an al kitabi about the book good so after prepositions the noun will have a kasra on the end usually it's majroor in any case and majroor is usually expressed with a kasra good the next one is the mudafilay Okay, the mudaf ilay. So you actually heard a second ago, and we say bismillahi. Okay, now we understand why it's bismi. It's not bisma or bismu. It's bismi because it comes after bi. But why is it Allahi? Why is it bismillahi? Why can't it be bismillahu or bismillaha? It's because the, the mudaf ilay, the possessor, because it's Allah's name. It's the name of Allah. The possessor or the mudaf ilayhi will be majroor. And usually this is expressed with a kasra. Almost always with the mudaf ilay. Very nice. Okay, so I'll give you some other examples. Let's say the name Abdullahi, the servant of Allah. The, the, it's a name, by the way. Here in Somali, where I live, everyone who's got the name Abdullah, they're all Abdullahi. It seems like places that I've visited, like Muslim Muslim places that I've visited that aren't Arabs, they seem to be really strict on their grammar. Actually, like even when I was in Uganda, in all of the in all of the madaris there, they all even refer to the salah time in fully expressed idafas, salatu duhri. The, the salah of duhr time or or salatul asri like they'll actually say that <laughs> they actually fully pronounce the 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 adafa, which is more than what the arabs do you will very rarely catch an arab say salatul asri <laughs> the, the, the salah of asr you know 
Very nice. Okay, let's continue. So, after prepositions, Next, for the counted noun, after the numbers 3 to 10. Okay, we talked about the counted noun for numbers 11 to 99, having fathas afterwards. So, for example, Ahada ashara kaukaban, 11 planets. But if it were, for example, three planets or four planets or six planets, okay, we'd use the plural, okay, which is, um, this maybe isn't the best example of actually, because this word's mamnurim and asaraf, which we'll talk about in a second. But, um, but if, if it were, actually, I don't want to ignore the rules. Let's say, let's say we're talking about four men, okay, we'd have arba'atu rijalin, okay, that would use the plural of rijal and make it rijalin. Uh, using these numbers, actually, I, I noticed student, students of mine who go and study Arabic in countries where their currency has a plural, I find they learn this really well. So, for example, in Jordan, they use dinars, I believe, so dinanir is the plural. So they get used to using the plural for the numbers 3 to 10, so they say khams dinanir or ashar dinanir, but using the singular for all the other numbers. But anyway, so whatever the counted noun is, okay, so dinanir, dinanir is memnurim and asaraf as well, it's not helping me. Okay, kitab, let's say, for example. I want to say five books. Khamsatu kutubin. Okay, the kutubin, after the, after the numbers from three to ten, it will be majroor. And it will be expressed with, with kasras. Very nice. Yeah, and then also the counted noun for numbers above 100 as well. So, for example, a thousand, right? Allah says in the Quran, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahrin. That the night of power is better than a thousand. Shahrin, or the book A Thousand and One Nights. Okay, Elfu Laylatin is a thousand nights. Elfu Laylatin, wa Laylatun. Yeah, so in, in Arabic, whenever you do like and one of something, a thousand and one, you don't say a thousand and one, you say a thousand nights and a night. That's like, uh, a thousand and one nights is translated to a thousand nights and a night. Elfu Laylatin, wa Laylatun. Okay, good. So, uh, so those numbers, right, from three to ten, and then also a hundred and, and up to the big numbers. Very nice. Okay, so you know, what I, mean? I asked you to put in your pocket cam uh, with the cam talibin. I asked you to put that in your pocket because we learned about cam taliban for a question: how many students? However, cam talibin, bring up your pocket for me so we can look at it. Cam talibin. This is, a, this is not a question anymore. This is an emphasis. This is an expression. Oh, how many students. Okay, Allah uses this many times in the Quran, actually. Kam min qaryatin Oh, how many towns have we destroyed? Oh, how many towns have we brought to ruin in the past, right? So we use kam. When you say kam qaryatin, it's kind of an abbreviation of kam min qaryatin, right? So um, that, that's how I remember it anyway. Because I, I remember that ayah, kam min qaryatin ahlaknaha. Yes, good. So after kam, if the word afterwards is majroor, it's for emphasis. But if the word after kam has, uh, is monsoob, it's actually a question. Good. So kam talibin and kam taliban, they mean two quite different things. Kam taliban is a question. Kam talibin. Oh, how many students. Okay, and then the last one. This is kind of related to, to, um, to the first point I made about prepositions, but I wanted to mention this on its own. So it's actually when we do um, qasam, when we take oaths on things. So we kind of teach the wow of qasam, the ba of qasam, the ta of qasam. We teach those, we kind of lump them in with prepositions when we teach them, because they, they do the same job, really. And I don't think they require lots of grammatical knowledge, because they're common they're in like common parlance among muslims wallahi tallahi billahi sometimes all three of them in the same sentence so anyway so taking oaths the word after it is majroor okay and usually that those are the most common oaths right the, the the humans us of creation we only really take oaths by allah right we say wallahi uh, billahi tallahi right any of those um, but Allah takes oath by many things in the Quran. He takes oaths by the sun, washemsi. He takes oath by the daybreak, wal fajri. Um, he takes an oath by uh, the the star, wal najmi. Okay, so um, yeah, he, he takes an oath by al balad, right? Not not wal baladi, but la uqsimu bihad al balad. Like rather, I I I, take, I I swear by this this balad. These the things I've just mentioned. Those are the triggers. For things being majroor, and they will express themselves as being majroor with a kasra or two kasras. But now we need to move on to something, which is a true, which where something will be majroor, but it will express itself as being majroor with a fatha. 
there's some words that I've alluded to already. We can't go over all of them now, right? But there's some words which are what we call memnur minasarf. What this means is that they cannot be fully vocalized. They cannot be fully vowed. So with words that are memnur minasarf, any attempt to use tenween with them is incorrect. If you ever see a word which is memnur minasarf, let me give you an example. For example, the name Yusuf. Okay, F names that are not originally Arabic or don't have a pattern which is originally Arabic um, in the Arabic language, they are memnur and asaf. You will never see in the Quran Yusufun or Ibrahimun or Sulaymanun. These are all names that are in their origin not Arabic. Good. So, words like this, if we were to say with Ibrahim, we can't say Ma'a Ibrahimi. We don't say Ma'a Ibrahimi. We say Ma'a Ibrahima. Okay, we say Ma'a. Ibrahima. Okay, so there are words that are memnur and asarf, which cannot take tenween ever. There are rare occasions when they can take a kasra. Like rare occasions, right? So for example, a word that's memnur and asarf, like lots of the plurals that are like longer, that have an extra elif in them perhaps. Like for example, the word mat'am means a, a, a restaurant. Mat'am means restaurant. Mat'am is memnur and asarf, okay? But like, if, if it's definite for a start, if it's L at the beginning, we could say fil mata'imi. Right? We, we, we can do that, right? So it, it can, there are occasions when it, it can do that. Or, um, or if it's a mudaf, even for example. So, um, for example, things that are in the pattern, like the one that we mentioned, the, the kind of um, comparative pattern, where we took kabir and made it akbar. You can never have akbar on. Akbar, that pattern, is mamnur man asarf. Any attempt to say akbarin, or akbarun or akbaran, it's not correct Arabic. Okay, it's 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 false. Any attempt to do that is false. Okay, so generally speaking, even if the word akbar, right, were to be majrur, it wouldn't take a kasra unless it began with l or if it was a mudaf. Okay, those are the only two exceptions. Um, I'll give you an example of that actually. So the word hakim, right, like wise, right, ahkam is the most wise or the 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 yeah, the most wise, let's just say that. Um, Allah also says at the end of Surah Atin, I believe, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ Okay, so أَحْكَمِ We actually do see that there, but we only see it because it's a mudaf. Okay? أَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ the, the, the best of, the, the most wise of judges, or something like that. The whole ayah, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ Is Allah not بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ is, is Allah not... Um, so, laysa with bi is, is a way of just saying laysa, right? There's, you can use either of those with laysa. I'm going to go on a little tangent. Let's welcome the thought bubble type deal. Using laysa, you can say, um, um, you know, هذا الفهم. <laughs> How do you remember this? Um, being When I was in the Netherlands um, a long time ago, I remember the, the imam of the khutbah, he obviously loved Arabic, right? And whenever he gave some, said something in Arabic... He often said it in two different grammatical ways. I think he, I don't know, like, I don't know if he, obviously didn't know who I was, but he was just like, he just really loved Arabic. And I remember him saying, هذا الفهم ليس صحيحا. This understanding isn't correct. And then he also said, وهذا الفهم ليس بصحيح. <laughs> he said both of them. He said, this understanding is not correct. And this understanding is not by correct. Okay, he, he used both of them. But what's going on here is we have ليس ب, right? ليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين. Okay, anyway, but I digress. Let's come back to the, um, the main topic of the, uh, of the lesson and uh, pop my thought bubble for now for so, so we can move on. So, and then the last one, the last kind of um, uh, symbol of something being, um, the last kind of symbol of something being, um, what is it, uh, majrur, is actually just a yeah. Okay, and likewise it is with the five nouns. So just as we saw in the Mod 4, we saw the five nouns as abu, father, ahu, brother, um, fu, mouth, hamu, in-law, ذو, um, possessor. We also saw أبا, أخا, فا, ذا, حما. We also saw those. And then likewise, I mean, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the uh, majrur rather, we also see أبي, for example, أنا كنت معي, I was أنا كنت مع rather, I was with أبي بكر. كنت مع مع أبي بكر. I was with أبي بكر because it's after مع. Right, or um, ma'a akhik, with your brother, ma'a akhik. Or we'd have the for the possessor, we'd have hami for an in-law, and then we'd have fi as well. So technically, fi fiq 
fee feek means in your mouth. Fee feek. Although fee isn't a very common way of saying saying mouth. You usually use the term femme to, to mean your mouth. But um and, and actually fee does have a plural as f where f where. It's used in sort of the nord actually. I mean f where he him for, from their mouths. So let's move into the final section of this episode of the Arabic and Sixty Steps podcast. The section on verbs in the Mejzum. Very nice. So as I say, verbs can, it's only verbs that can be mejzum. Nouns cannot be mejzum. So we haven't got two sections of this. And if you remember me saying that in kind of the, um, the Western tradition, we tend to use the term zero case. It's because maybe the most common indicator of a verb being mejzum is the sukun. Okay, the sukun is probably the most common indicator. So what triggers this? Okay, tr- this is triggered by lem. Just like len meant in the future won't, lem in the past means didn't. Okay, so just like we said in the future, lem yaktobe, he will not write. If we said len, but put a sukun on the end instead of a fatha, len yaktob, he didn't write. He didn't write. So lem is a way of triggering a verb being medzul. Very nice. The next is kind of the imperative. The imperative is when you command someone, it, it comes from the imperative somewhat. Okay, there's a couple of steps on that we go. Like, for, for example, the imperative of katebe is uktub. Okay, it's uktub. But this really does come from, from, from an imperative. Because once you've got the imperative, yektub, you cut off that yeah at the beginning. So we've just got ktub. And then if the first letter has a sukun, because in Arabic you don't really start words with a sukun, right? Like, it's quite difficult even to, to vocalize ktub. Ktub, right? So what you do if there's a sukun on that first letter is you put an elif at the beginning. And uh, if the middle letter, in this case, yek uktub, if it's an u, you put an u on the elif at the beginning. So you have uktub. If it were um, uh, jelesa, for example, lem yejlis, so we have yejlis and then cut off the ya, so we have jlis. Because it's an i underneath, if it were an a on top, we'd put an i at the beginning. So ijlis is what we have. There's a whole lesson on that. I'm not expecting you to fully understand how to use imperatives and stuff in Arabic from that. But... Um, yeah, but anyway, it comes it comes from an imperative. It comes from the mejzum, the imperative does. The negative imperative is much closer. We really just use we just use the mejzum in the second person. Because when we do imperatives, we kind of command them to the second person. And we use le. So for example, le tektub, don't write. Le tektub, le tejlis, don't sit. Le taqra, don't read. Good. Next is um, what we call if clauses, right? Like, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be if, actually. I mean, it's really just conditionals, like, if this, then that. Or it's actually used many times in the Qur'an, whoever this, then that, you know. Um, for example, Allah says in Surah Al-Talaq, actually, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Okay, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not reciting it with good tajweed there. But um, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ Whoever, whoever fears Allah, مَخْرَجًا He will make for him a way out. Okay, so, and then يَتَّقِ is in the majzum. Okay, so when we do these if something or whosoever this, then this thing will happen, um, we use them in the majzum. Okay, or, or, or the majzum is an option for us. Good, or for example, um, you know, the, the words for if usually are low, if it's um, hypothetical. And then, so for example, if it's something that can never happen, you know, low, low, low akun, like if I was low akun, Somali yen, if I was a Somali, right? It's completely hypothetical. I can't become a Somali, like, like, do you know what I mean? Something completely hypothetical. You would use it for that. And if it was something that was not hypothetical, you would use in or either. Yeah. So if it's something that you can do, for example, in, in ajtahid, if I work hard, in ajtahid. Good. We don't need to go through all of the mechanics of that. Okay, so those are actually kind of triggers of something being mejzum. And those triggers are applicable regardless. And, and those triggers can cause something to be mejzum. And then the, the mejzum can express itself in various different ways. So, so if we move on to words that are plural, verbs that are plural. So I mean, this is exactly the same as what I mentioned with monsoub verbs, actually. If you remember the five verbs, this una ending, if we have the word yaktubuna, if we say they didn't write, we say lem yaktubu. They didn't write. Lem yektubu. So this u with a wow and an elif, that is, um, yeah, that's an indicator um, that it is medzum. And likewise with the feminine, with enti, as we talked about, um, yeah, rather than saying 
um, you didn't write with tektubi, you know, we'd say lem tektubi. So just the e on the end can be an indicator for something being mejizum. Okay, the last three things. The last three things are all about final week verbs. Because when we talk about the endings and putting sukuns on the end and expressing them, like words tend to express their case with their endings, right? Like that, that, that's how words in Arabic tend to express their, their case. Unlike in English, where we express a case with a completely different word, right? I, me, and my. It's almost completely different words. Um, with final week verbs, let's take a verb like um, um, ittaqa. The verb ittaqa, meaning to, to have piety or to fear, or to fear, but you only really use this for fearing Allah, right? Okay, so you know I mentioned it would usually be ittaqa yattaqi, okay? But in the in the majzum when we said men before it and whosoever fears Allah, we said wa man yattaqi, just with a kasra on the end. So with the final weak verb like ittaqa yattaqi, in the majzum that e would be cut to just a kasra, okay? And this this happens with all verbs like this. So we take the verb like to cry baka yabki, okay? I didn't cry, lam abki. It would usually be ebki, I cry. We'd say lam ebki, I didn't cry. Which would move that e to just a shorter e. So we can actually have an e, an a, and an u, the shortened versions of them, in the majzum of final week verbs, right? So I gave an example of an e becoming e. For example, like yebki, lam yebki, or yattaqi, man yattaqi. Um, but I'll give an example as well if it were to um, be a fatha. Right, so for example, let's have the verb um, ra'a, okay, it means to see, in the present tense is yara. That's yara, it's actually written with alif maqsura, right, but it has an a ah sound. When it's used in the majzum, we see this many times in the Qur'an with lam tara. We don't have tara, we have that shortened to tara. For example, in Surah Al-Feel, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel. We have alam tara. Okay, that's that long alif is shortened to a, a fatha. Alam tara. Very nice. And then, uh, then I'll give an example of um, of when a u would become a uh, a dhammar, a, a shortened one. Right. Let's take a verb like da'a, which means to invite or to. It, it means to invite, but it kind of has the connotation of inviting people to religion. Right. Because well, it's certainly in the West anyway, because we know the term da'wa and we hear the word da'wa and stuff. Like even non-Muslim English speakers often know what the term da'wa means. That they know that it means like calling people to Islam. But um, the verb da'a in the present sense is yadru. So when we do the majzum of this, we end up having lam yadru, yadru, just with a dhamma on the end rather than an u, because because we've done majzum, we've cut it short, right? We've done lam yadru, meaning he didn't invite. Lem yadruhu. He didn't invite him. Lem yadruhu. Okay, that is everything for this pretty long, but I think really productive and really useful episode of the Arabic in 60 Steps podcast. Once again, I'll just reiterate that um, all of my notes for this are compiled into a very nice and easy to follow um, PDF as well. It's about five or six pages and it's available for people who are on the Arabic in 60 Steps program. We'll put it in your notes area. Actually, the beginning of the program, you have like useful links and stuff. I'll put it in the downloadables section at the beginning next to the paste chart. I'll put it in there. And then for those of you who are, um, who are, um, supporters of the Arabic in 60 Steps YouTube channel, um, yeah, then it'll be available for you guys as well, because I, I really want to encourage that, because we've got some things we really need to invest in equipment-wise and stuff, and we're, we're behind on some of those things that we really need for the channel. So any kind of contribution towards helping us get new equipment and things like that for the YouTube channel and help with the studio would, is, is an absolutely amazing help. And for those of you guys who support, um, I, I'd like to give you guys something extra. So for you guys... Um, there is uh, this resource for you guys as well. Thank you all so much uh, for tuning in and for joining me for another episode of the Arabic in 60 Steps podcast. You can join our Arabic program, arabic60steps.com. But until the next episode, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu.